the day the Lord has made. It was right and it's good that we think the thing to him. But this is something God has given to us. Before we begin, there is one more question. Yes, 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 Okay. And then Pat, you can stay up here and I'll give the word of the Lord. has a special time through Lent. And there are envelopes in the pews uh, for you to uh, put your money in or write. You can even, even, excuse me, either leave it at the back of the church or you can mail it in at another time. I thank you. 1998, Ed and I lived in Vallejo, California. And we enjoyed and were very active in the Community Presbyterian Church. I had some serious health issues. And we found ourselves at the local hospital in the middle of the night, not knowing what was going to happen. At that point, or at some point that night, I was alone in a semi-dark room cold and shaking, I started to pray. I, I prayed the Lord's Prayer and then just talked to God. I remember him telling me, uh, or I remember him telling and talking, and I said, what a wonderful life I had, and if it was my turn to go to him. I was fine. I also remember saying, your will be done, because really, my life was his. And at that moment, I felt a glowing heat was warm. It's so hard for me to talk about, I'm sorry. Was warm all over and felt his love surround me like a cushion. During this time, the doctor was talking to Ed and said, the one chance to help me was to try and get a hold of a special traveling medicine unit to see if they were in the area. The medic unit was found on the freeway going in the opposite direction from the hospital, but was just 10 minutes away. Fifteen more days in the hospital gave me plenty of time to reflect and talk to Jesus Christ about what he wanted me to do. Fast forward three months, with the help of Ed and a cane, it was my first time back at church. I was sitting in the fellowship hall after the service, and a friend came up to me and asked if I would be open to take the training to become a Stephen minister. I thought about it for half a second and said, yes, if Ed would join me, which I really knew he would. What a wonderful and heartfelt time that was, learning to share the gospel, prayer, meeting and helping those in crisis through their dark time. God showed us another opportunity on our journey, helping to spread his word. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate your sharing. Randy?
Brothers and sisters, please join me. Holy One, dwell within us. Glimmer in our vision. We wait with open ears, open eyes, and open hearts. Amen. As we begin this prayer, I'd ask you to do one thing for me. I'm going to offer that first paragraph. And then I'd like you to join me where it says, we confess all the way through to the amen. Let's pray. Covenant-making God, you use every possible means to reach us. Breathing your spirit in us, calling us by name, showing us symbols of your promise, offering us a new way of life. We confess that our hearts are hardened we choose certainty over faith, anxiety over courage, independence over compassion. We turn our eyes from our neighbors in need and from stories of despair and from pleas for peace and from everything that goes. For we prefer our own comfort. We get caught up in our own needs and desires and forget you have made us to be your people together. May I bring your word on our hard hearts again, O oh God. Then break them open for what breaks yours, that your word might sink in and become part of us, so we might truly live as if you are our God and we are your people. We pray in the name of the one whose love breaks all bounds, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please hear the good news. Paul writes to Timothy, Do not be ashamed of testifying to God who saves us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our wor works, but in virtue of God's own purpose and the grace God gave in Christ Jesus years ago. By that grace, we are saved. Let us believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ and are forgiven. If you would have the fullness of joy that God has stored up for you, be you likewise gracious and forgiving. Shall be world without end. 
In chapter 29, listen to God's word. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And from 2 Timothy, the second chapter, beginning with the eighth verse. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is, not, it is no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. This ends the reading of God's word. To his name be glory and praise. Amen. Thank you. 
Would you join me in prayer, please? Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. Amen. At dawn one Sunday in February 1966, I found myself sitting on a stump in a, the woods near Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and I was crying. On that weekend, I had been on a retreat put on by the campus Christian organization. Now, I'm not sure why I went because I was not a member of that organization. But they'd invited me, and for some mysterious reason, I had said yes. It had been 13 months since I had survived a near fatal automobile accident. 13 months of feeling anxious and afraid. I was angry, confused, lost, and insecure. I sat on that stump with tears freezing to my cheeks, and I recall saying out loud, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do or where to go. I don't know who I am or what I should do. Help me. I was out on that stump, I don't know how long, and all of a sudden a wave of peacefulness swept over me, and I felt like I was being hugged. And then all of a sudden it felt like my thoughts became hijacked. I had this strong sensation, this, this unbelievable rush, a sense of calling, you could say, that I, me, should be a minister. Now, nowhere in the menu of life choices was that ever on it. I had not gone to school for that purpose. But all of a sudden, I am filled with this sense that I ought to be a minister. Now, after some time had passed, I returned to the retreat center, and eventually we began our trip home on the bus. And I shared with someone what had happened, and I did so some, with somewhat fear and trepidation. But I was confident what I had to do. I had never had that kind of feeling before, nor had I ever had those kinds of thoughts before. I was a cradle Christian, and I went to church every single Sunday, not always by choice. And I had perfect attendance at Sunday school. I had a big long pin that showed that. But never, ever had I considered a career in ministry. But for the first time in over a year, instead of feeling anxious, I was calm. Instead of being afraid, I was confident. For the first time in a long time, I was not angry. In fact, I was content. I was happy. Now, I had no idea what to do with this newfound knowledge. But... I decided that I had to follow where it was going to lead. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stories that follow this one, but I'm not going to tell them right now. But at this moment, I look back and I think I was experiencing what later I would learn to be what the truth behind the words God spoke to the people of Judah who had been in exile in Babylon for over 70 years. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God declared, I know 
the plan I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now, the energy I found in this text, the joy and the excitement that, and peace that it, that it brings, rests in the fact that we never know and never are out of God's heart or mind. We are always part of his plans. The people of Judah had repeatedly refused to submit to God. They'd been stiff-necked. They'd been stubborn. They, had, they thought that they knew better than God. And every step of the way, they always screwed it up. They repeatedly made one bad decision after another to where the Babylonians swept in, overwhelmed their army, sacked their temple, and destroyed the capital city of Jerusalem. And then to add insult to injury, the Babylonians gathered up all the elite and the leadership and took them off into exile in Babylon. There these people remained for 70 years. Generations had come and gone, and the people had no sense they would ever go home again. And what made this worse, most of them had been born in exile. They didn't know what their ancestral home was. These people had feelings akin to mine. But God came to them as he came to me. And he declared, I have a plan for you. Now, as you read this verse, you are instantly impressed that God's plan is a well thought out plan. You have always been on God's mind. It's a plan to prosper us, not to harm us. It's a plan to give us hope and to secure a future. My friends, this is who God is. This is what God does and what God is constantly doing. He sees us. I think that's the best part of this. God sees each of us individually and collectively as a congregation. God sees us. And he's declaring to us that we have a significant part to play in his plan. And when we embrace that plan, we call that plan our own. When we trust him to lead us where we don't know what the end point is, we can be assured that we are going to prosper. We're going to have hope. And we are guaranteed a future. God has a mission to bring all people from all walks of life, from every race, creed, color, language, and sexual orientation into a saving relationship with him through Jesus Christ. We're part of that plan. We're part of his mission. He's looking at us who have and are being saved from our soiled, broken, embarrassing past to be his partners in this plan and in this mission. You know, Jeremiah shares with the people what this means. He said, the people will call on the Lord and will pray to him and God will listen to you. If you seek God out with all your heart, you will find him. You know, for years, this church has been engaged in ministry. But today, there is a new plan for this church. God wants us to go out. He's sending us out, sending us into the community where we can share the story of Jesus Christ with those who don't always realize that they're hungry and they're thirsty for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. They know they need something. They just don't know right now that it is that. God's plan is for us to share the stories of what is happening in our lives because of Jesus Christ. God is sending us out 
to be his voice, speaking to people in words they can understand. The power of God's love to transform and to renew. Now, we've all experienced that. We've experienced transformation and renewal. Our lives are filled with moments when God has brought us peace. He's calmed our anxieties, brought clarity to, in place of confusion, and order in the, to, to replace chaos. Every single one of us knows Christ intimately. And each of us, in our own way, has a unique way of sharing what it has meant to let Jesus into our hearts and lives. When you share your story, it is God speaking through you. It is a word people can believe, and they can trust it because they see it and they know you. You become the very real example of what happens when you can trust in the Lord your God in all times and in all circumstances. You are very relatable. God's plan for you is to share the word through your own personal faith journey. You are a walking, breathing sermon every single day. Your life is a testimony to what God has, is, can, and will continue to do. And his plan for your life, and you can look at the evidence all around you, his plan for your life is to prosper you, not to harm you. It has brought you hope as well as a future. Now that leads me to the second text I shared with you from 2 Timothy. Because Paul says to Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. The Christ who was raised from the dead, who descended from David. This is my gospel. You know, Paul's life was transformed by Christ. He'd found purpose for his life because of Jesus Christ. The Christ who died, the Christ who rose, and the Christ who continued to be so dear to his heart. Jesus Christ helped Paul make sense of everything that had happened to him, even being chained and thrown into prison. Now, his message is very plain and very simple. He says, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And here's where these words become an echo with those offered by Jeremiah. Keep remembering, keep reminding God's people of these things. The Christian that God needs for this 21st century is one who feels the joy and hope that we've experienced because of Jesus Christ. And to possess the confidence to share that story of what God has done in Christ in you there are people who will listen to you. Trust me, there are people who will listen to you because you speak their language. You speak words they can understand. You're living lives they can identify with as they see the evidence of God's work in you. The congregation that God needs to be in the 21st century is one that embraces and seeks to fulfill God's mission of calling all people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ in grace through him. Someone recently made a statement where upon reflecting on the chaos of the day and their concern for the future of 
us as a people and nation. And he made a set, the comment that we really right now need to hear God speak boldly and loudly, just like God spoke to the, in the Old Testament. And I instantly, my, there was a knee-jerk reaction, I guess, in me. I instantly had to say, no, 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 no. God is speaking. God is screaming through us. God has sent us into the world to give witness to his glory in Christ. And wherever we go, with whomever we meet, we are to share the good news of Jesus Christ through the stories of our lives with God. Wherever we go as a congregation and to whomever we meet in the community, we need to let them know that God has a plan for their life, a plan to prosper and not harm them, a plan of hope and of a magnificent future. There are neighborhoods all around us who don't realize their need until you, until we, begin to share our testimony with them. God said he had a plan for us. And it's all summed up in the words that, of, that Jesus spoke in Matthew 25, called the Great Commission. You know how that begins? I go out into the world. God is sending us out into the world, out amongst the places where we live, the places that we frequent, and we are to preach, to teach, and to baptize. And the best way to do this is to tell your story. Share your experience with grace and forgiveness. Talk about what it's like to have God in Christ restore wholeness and hope. Be an example of joy and the realization of an abundant future. I beg you, I implore you, accept your part in God's plan. Become his voice. Share your story. Become sowers of the seed of new life. Because you see, this is everyone's mission. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, God of all compassion and consolation, your breath alone brings life to dry bones and weary souls. And so today I ask that you pour out your spirit upon us, that we may face despair and death with the hope of resurrection. Help us to dance with your spirit, the breath of life which calls, out, calls us out of the valley of dry bones and into the kingdom of God. Holy Father, Father of Christ, who revealed the way of life, inscribe your law in, on our hearts that in this life we may be the body of Christ. Help our hands hold the sick and the suffering. Help our feet to walk with the poor. Help our ears to listen to those who live in despair. May our eyes be fixed upon the suffering of the cross and the hope of an empty tomb so that we may live as resurrected people. Sovereign Lord, Father of all, in the power of the Spirit, you know our faults and yet you promise to forgive, so keep us in your presence and give us your wisdom. Open our hearts to gladness, call dry bones to dance, and restore to us the joy of your salvation. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
as we continue now to pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now this commission and benediction. Go now and trust in God's mercy for your strength. Proclaim the good news wherever God calls you, and do not set yourselves apart from others, but be all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. And may God give you the strength and the freedom of an eagle. May Christ be the bread that nourishes and renews you. And may the Holy Spirit be the rising wind beneath your wings. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And great.